Hilltop Securities is leading the herd in municipal finance. Building on a 75-year legacy of public service and trusted personal relationships, through decades-long partnerships with local government, state agencies, and nonprofits, we've made a lasting impact on our communities. We've helped state HFAs make housing more affordable by providing mortgage hedging and pipeline management. And we've helped generations of individual and institutional investors reach their financial goals. That tradition continues as we find new ways to support our clients' changing needs. Good afternoon, and welcome to our third installment of Housing Washington Luncheon 2023. I'm Bob Peterson, Deputy Director of the Washington State Housing Finance Commission, and I'm your moderator today. We are honored to have as our guest speaker today a person I've heard many times across the country speaking about housing. Chris Herbert is the Managing Director of Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies. He's been there for the past nine years. His organization authors many reports on housing on many different areas of housing, home ownership, multifamily across this nation. He will give you some insights and some stories about how we can do better in creating affordable housing. Most important, if you have questions today, please use the Q&A feature. At a time during the presentation, we will stop for questions. And with that, I hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be with you today. I'm sorry I can't be with you in the great state of Washington. You have a beautiful state, um, but I'm glad that we have this option to be able to be with you and uh, being across the country is hard. So let me start sharing my screen. Um, what I want to share with you today is um, work related to our annual State of the Nation's Housing Report. It comes out every June, uh, and it's been coming out every June since 1988. So largely what I'll draw upon today is from that report with a bit of an update since then, since housing markets are always evolving. Just to give you a preview of uh, what I'm going to talk about, the, the five big themes I want to hit on. First of all, is just that we are in a situation where housing markets are cooling in response to Fed rate hikes but that tight market conditions really are providing a floor underneath those housing market declines. Talk a bit about home ownership trends, which has increased sharply in recent years, but uh, higher housing costs and higher interest rates are gonna make further gains quite unlikely. Uh, then I'll touch upon rental housing affordability, how much has worsened in the face of rising rents, and then talk about how housing instability has increased with that as well. And I'll close with a brief discussion about the fact that uh, we need to invest in our housing stock to address a number of uh, issues that are arising today. So that's the broad brush what I'm gonna cover. Let me dive in. So the first theme about housing markets cooling, two big indicators I wanna focus on here. This first is house prices and rents. And this is really kind of the headline issues in the housing market. Here I'm showing you the sweep going back to early 2000s of the annual change in apartment rents and home prices. Um, and what's really uh, uh, startling here is if you look on the right-hand side, what happened during the pandemic. We had an amazing increase in housing prices that started pretty much shortly after the pandemic started. We started to see people realize that the that, uh, need for space was, it was uh, intense during the time we're all working from home, studying from home, playing from home. Um, and so we saw the demand for uh, individual single family houses go up, house prices started to grow and grew nationally by 20% at the peak. You can see there that rents actually fell initially as a lot of young people gave up their apartments to move back home, to move to second homes, to move to different parts of the country. But then a year later, when they realized this was gonna be with us for a while and move back into their, their lives, uh, we then saw rents follow that house price trend and start to grow again by double digits. So when the Fed started to act on inflation in uh, early 2022, the sector that really felt that the most was the housing sector. And it had an immediate impact on both housing prices and rents and threw cold water on those markets. And we saw house prices and rent growth really fall dramatically since then. The other side of the coin is on the supply side. You know, the interest rates had a big if impact on the single family supply of the market. And as we see here, I think we're starting just now to see the impact on the multifamily side. Just to give you a little bit of the longer story before the, the Fed moves, this chart's going all the way back to 2000. And what you can see is that in the early 2000s, when we had the housing bubble, we had tremendous increase in housing construction. And almost all of that, in fact, all of the increase was on the single family side. By, the, by 2006, we were building 1.8 million single family housing units a year. Multifamily was pretty steady state of about 375, 350 all through that period. 
Then when you had the housing crash, single family starts fell to 400,000, which was a record we hadn't seen since the pre-World War II era. Um, multifamily starts slow down, but they came back faster and actually have been above trend since about 2014. You can see for single family, it was a slow slog to get back to a million. Finally got back to a million right before the pandemic and after initial interruption, surged to 1.2 million housing units. So I, I wanna talk more about the housing supply side of this, but uh, for much of the last decade, we hadn't been building enough housing and most of that was single family. You can see here that the Fed action though really pulled the rug out from underneath the single family market. So it went from 1.2 million down to 800,000 a year or within a year or so of those first moves. And we've lately seen single family start starting to, to come back up near that million a year mark which is good news because we need more houses, but it would be higher than that if it weren't for the fact that interest rates are at 7%. Uh, on the multifamily side, interestingly, that uh, period after the Fed started to act, multifamily starts have been trending up and they kept uh, at a very high level, about 550,000 a year up until uh, just a couple of months ago when we're now seeing multifamily starts start to slow fairly dramatically and given everything we understand about the finances of multifamily housing, we expect to see that slowdown continue through the end of this year and into next year. So the, the Fed actions clearly threw uh, cold water on prices and rents, hit the single family market and construction side hard to begin with. That's easing a bit, uh, whereas the multifamily supply cutbacks are really only starting to be evident now. So as I said at the beginning, you know, we expect to see that there's uh, going to be a floor for how much the housing market declines, seeing that already in that the, the story about housing, single family housing starts. But let me dig into this, why it is that these tight market conditions are going to provide that floor. Um, this is a chart I'd like to use to kind of tell the big picture story of where we are in housing supply. The top line, the green line, is the um, number of new housing units added a year. So this is housing completed plus manufactured homes placed. And then the purple line, that dark line, is the number of new households added per year. And so you can see that we always build more housing than households, or we have, uh, because we need to not just account for the growth in households, we also have to account for the fact that we're replacing older housing all the time. We also are adding second homes. We also need to add more vacant units so there's more slack in the market as the overall market gets bigger. For much of this period of this, uh, from the 70s through the 90s, that ratio of completions to household formation was about 1.3, meaning we had about 30% more new housing than households. That's the amount of slack we need to kind of keep balance in the market. What you can see is, uh, it's a little hard to see, but during the period of the early 2000s, during the boom, we were actually building 50% more housing than households. That gap between those two lines got bigger. We were really overbuilding. So if you look after the housing bust, there was a period of time when we needed to build less housing. Those lines needed to kind of come together to build off that excess inventory. But as you can see, that that um, housing starts number, completions number, has continued to track households. And in the last two years has actually tr uh, fallen short of households. So what that's telling us is that we are underbuilding housing. We're not building enough housing to keep up with household growth, let alone with the replacement of housing units or the need for second homes or vacancies. So serious underbuilding has been happening over particularly the last five or six years. If we look at what type of housing, as I showed earlier in that chart with the starts number, single family starts have been the place where construction has really lagged its historical levels. This chart is breaking down the owner-occupied market construction levels into big homes, that's the top line, more than 1,800 square feet, smaller homes, that's the yellow line, under 1,800 square feet, manufactured homes, the green line, and condos, the black line at the bottom. If you go back to 2000, a little more than half, just a little more than half of all new homes were larger homes above 1,800 square feet. But if you look at the right-hand side of this chart, you can see a lot of the recovery in construction that has occurred has been among those larger homes with much less among smaller homes, manufactured homes, or condos. So today, two thirds of all homes being built are large and only a third are small. So when we think about the, the shortage of supply, it's more modest entry-level homes that we're simply not building. Um, another indicator of the tight market is the existing home market. When if we're not building enough housing, it puts more pressure on the existing home market to supply that need for housing. The yellow uh, area here is showing you the number of homes on the market. The line is showing you the month supply. 
And you can see back in the early part of this decade, we typically had about two to three, two and a half million homes on the market. We had about a four month supply. After we got through the bus and working through the excesses of the market, that, that inventory and that month supply has been trending down year after year to the low point during the, the pandemic when we had only about a million, a million and a half homes on the market. And that was about two years, two months supply or less. We've had some increase in supply since as the market slowed down, but it's only been from a very low level. And so we're still at a point where the housing market, existing housing market is incredibly tight. And that is keeping strong demand up for the few homes that come on the market and buoying house prices. On the multifamily side, but, um, the one way that we illustrate the, the shortfall in modest housing is looking at the rent distribution over time. So the orange bars are the distribution of apartments by rent level in these different increments shown along the x-axis there. And the purple bars are that same rent distribution in 2021. So two things that stand out. One is if you look at the right-hand side, almost all the additions to the multifamily stock have been about high rent apartments. And so this is a, similar to the single family market, what we're building are higher end, higher rent apartment buildings and add into the stock. On the left hand side, you can see that what we've seen is a big shortfall in low cost units. Uh, among those units running less than $600, there's been a loss of 4 million units over the decade. And what this is just reflecting is the fact that in these tight market conditions, the rent distribution is shifting up and leaving those people out of the market. Now, this chart looks different than the others because they pulled it off our website. You can see at the bottom there, it says select a state. You can go on our website and look at different parts of the country and see how this looks differently. So let's look at Washington State. If we look at Washington State, what you can see is that that, that pattern is evident, but to a greater degree. The shift of the housing market to these high rent levels has been much more dramatic. More of the housing now is above $1,400 than then below it. And the, that's a big difference from before. And a loss of units uh, renting at lower levels is not just among those under 600, but 600 to 800 and 800 to 1,000. So all told in the Washington state area, you've lost hundreds of thousands of units renting for below $1,000. And then they've been replaced by units renting increasingly above 1,500 or $2,000. Um, the other indicator of tightness on the multifamily side is the vacancy rate. And this is showing you back to 2013, those vacancy rates for different class apartments have been pretty steady at about that four to 5% range. So indicating a pretty tight market. Um, during the, the beginning of the pandemic, class A apartment rents vacancies went up a bit and then they all crashed down to historic lows in 2022 as demand surged. And so, um, what we're seeing now is a softening in those markets as the, uh, the pressure from the Fed rates is, is, uh, in, is in putting some slack into the market. But you can see that it's already tailing off at vacancy rates that aren't far above where they were. So um, we are not seeing the multifamily market slacken yet to any great degree. Um, so, um, so in terms of putting a floor into the market, I, I let off this talk by showing you the trend in the annual change in prices and rents. And what you saw was that they've been going up at double digits and now they're down close to zero. This is adding now to that chart, the level of prices and rents. This is just for home prices. So what we can see is that as much as we've seen a real slowdown in the growth rate, that has not translated into much decline in the overall level of prices. We did have month over month declines for a while. That's starting to end. And we're seeing house prices in, start, in fact start to edge up again. So that tight market, even though the Fed has acted to put interest rates to 7%, uh, that put a damper on the market because there's so little supply, the demand that's out there is bidding prices back up once again. Similar story on the rental side. Price gro the growth in rents is slow dramatically, but the level of rents is still high. So we're looking at nationally. In 2021, an apartment that rented, the median apartment rented for $1,400. Now it's $1,800. And as while well, we're seeing softening in the market, it's at a very a level of unaffordability. Now, just to put this in context a bit for Washington, um, this is uh, house prices for Seattle. So that same house price chart, what you can see here is that there's been a bit more dramatic swing in Seattle in that during the period of time of cooling in response to the, the Fed's moves, house prices actually fell, not just growth rate closed, went to zero. But here too, 
they have rebounded and they rebounded at a levels that are well above what they were prior to the pandemic. So just two more slides in this section. I do wanna look forward a little bit. As much as the housing market is tight as it is now, there's some indication on the multifamily side, we may start to see some slack growing. One uh, indicator of that is the rate of absorption of uh, professionally managed apartments. This, the bars here show you how many net additions to occupied apartments that were in real page data over time. You can see that it was pretty consistent from 2015 through 2020, a dip in the early part of the pandemic, and then a surge to almost double the, the levels of absorptions that had been previously. But over the last year, those absorptions have turned negative. So we are seeing that there's been some slackening of demand for high uh, professionally managed apartments. And the other piece of the puzzle is supply. So what we're seeing is the pipeline of units under, the, under construction is at record high. The yellow part of this chart is for both single and multifamily housing, how many units are under construction. And you can see we're at a level we've never been this high going back uh, 40 years, 50 years. Um, if you look at the orange line, that's multifamily apartments under construction. We're now at a million apartments in the pipeline. So in some phase of construction, that's much higher than it's, it's been since the early 70s. And so we are seeing a lot of multifamily apartments that are going to come online against that slowing demand suggests that we should see greater slack in the market going forward and hopefully some more downward pressure on rents uh, because that's creating a tremendous affordability problems. All right, I, I just threw a lot at you. Bob, I might take a pause here. I can't see the, the chat or the Q&A. Are there any questions that have come in? There are no questions as yet, Chris, so carry on. All right. And so folks out there, if you do um, have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Bob will keep an eye on them so that um, we can we can catch some of those in the middle of the presentation as well. And Bob, jump in if you see any. Um, all right, let me talk a bit about home ownership. So um, this chart is the bars are showing you the number of homeowners in the country going back to the early 2000s. The line is showing you the home ownership rate. And if you look in the middle of the chart, what's astounding is that from 2006 to 2016, we had essentially no growth in homeowners for a decade. That's incredible period of stagnation in the homeowner demand in the market. You know, by 2016, the overall national ownership rate was down about 63%. Given that trend that had been happening down from 69% a decade earlier, a lot of people are pro projecting that we're going to see a home ownership rate in the country about 60% by the time where we are where we are today. But in fact, what happened, there was a pivot in the market in 2016. And I think our understanding of what happened is that we had this loss of homeowners from uh, through the housing bust and afterwards, both because we had an enormous wave of foreclosures to pulling people out of home ownership. We had a great recession that undermined people's um, financial ability to buy homes. And so the, the entry level home buyer market was shrinking foreclosures were taking the wind out of the sales of homeowner market. And by around 2016, foreclosures had ended, the uh, financial situation of households improved, and the millennial generation got to the point of life where they're ready to buy homes. And we've seen since then, since 2016, a gain of 10 million homeowner households. And as this chart shows you, those gains were significant even through 2022, the first couple of years of the pandemic. Now, um, the, the, the situation we're in now is obviously very different than it was in 2022. Um, and it's two things. One is we've seen that rise in prices that I showed you earlier that has been astronomical. And the second is the Fed's movement on interest rates. But let's take a look at house prices first. So this chart is showing you um, a distribution of uh, markets by the price to income ratio, the house median house price to median income ratio. The orange line is what that ratio is for the country as a whole. So focus on that for a second. Between 2000 and 2005, that number went from about three and a quarter to a little more than four and a half. So prior to 2000, the rule of thumb generally was that house prices would be about three times income. That was a level at which households with their savings and their incomes could afford to buy a house. Four and a half at the peak of the housing bubble was considered an astronomically high level. 
And sure enough, after that bubble burst, that, that ratio came back down to about the three and a quarter level. So 2011, 2012, we're kind of back to a relatively affordable market again. Since then, we've seen house prices rise fa uh, uh, faster than incomes. So that ratio has been rising. And again, a significant pivot in 2019 when the prices started going up uh, uh, incredibly fast. So we're now at a point where the national price to income ratio is north of 5.5, levels never seen before. Now I wanna focus a bit on the, the, the bars here, the distribution. These are taking the top 100 markets and dividing them into ranges of under three, three to four, four to five, and five and over. Look at the green bars first. That's the under three. Go back to 2000, the far left-hand side. In 2000, two thirds of the markets in the country had a price to income ratio of under three. That was kind of what we considered to be affordable. Only 10% had prices above four, those top two bars there that are blue in color. Look at where we are today. There's one market left with a price to income ratio under three, and there's three quarters out of ratios above four and half that are above five. That price to income ratio, when it's that high, means not only is it so a bigger stretch to get your incomes to qualify for a home, obviously it makes a big difference if interest rates are 3% or 7%, but it's still a stretch. Um, and the amount of cash you have to bring to the saving, the closing table becomes a big share of your income. Let's take a look at what these numbers look like in Washington over the last few years. So back in August of 21, we had interest rates at 2.8%. House prices for the state were at 543000 according to, um, I think this is the Zillow median home price. Um, even then, at that house price, the average person with paying just a 3.5% down in closing costs had to come up with $35,000 to buy a house. Um, the average the income that you needed to qualify for that mortgage was $131,000. Pretty significant, but nothing like what happened over the next two years. As interest rates jumped to 5.2% in 2022 and 7.1% uh, this past year, even though house prices have moderated, house prices in 23 are at 587,000, not too far above where they were. You still need to have $38,000 in cash to close. And now you need um, uh, income of nearly $200,000 in the state of Washington. Our, our website uh, today put out a blog that lets you do this for different market areas. In Seattle, it's even higher. So, I mean, these, these numbers are kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. This is for a median price house. What do you have in income? What do you have to have in savings to be able to afford a house? Now, one of the concerns here is not just in general that affordability has gotten so bad, but as we think about racial gaps in home ownership, what does this imply about our ability to close those gaps? This chart on the left is showing you the trends in the home ownership rate by race. Um, it actually was kind of astounding that between 2019 and 2022, nationally, we saw home ownership gaps close for, for Black and Asian Hispanic home buyers as their gains in home ownership exceeded that of whites. Um, now, mind you, this was a period of time when um, there was a, a lot of interest in buying homes and interest rates were so low. Um, but if you look at the right-hand side, those gaps between the, the white rates and the and rates for people of color are still astronomically large. And in this climate, with the amount of money you need to, to close, both income and savings, um, it's going to be really difficult for people of color to be able to meet those, those, bar, those bars and to be able to close these gaps further. So the, today's affordable environment uh, is going to make closing these gaps more challenging. Chris, I have a few questions for you. you want to uh, take some now? Yeah. Or I'm going to take them okay. now. The first question I have, what are some of the factors driving the decrease in rental demands? <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, <clears throat> partly it's generational that what we're seeing is that um, the, the millennial generation has gotten to an age where they're realize that you know being married, having two kids and a dog, having a house is a whole lot more convenient than living in an apartment. So that's what we have seen a lot of, you know, a, a lot of growth over time had been in renters, in higher income renters. The biggest growth had been among renters making more than $75,000 a year. So part of it is that group moving out. Um, now, mind you, 
that uh, given the affordability situation right now, it's that we're not don't expect a lot of people moving to home ownership. So I think the other factor that's happening is the rents are just too damn high. <laughs> And so I think that there is kind of a filtering process happening. So I think these, what I was showing you there was the professionally managed apartments. I think they're having a tougher time because when their rents are as high as they are, and the people, you know, people are going to stretch to try to get into those. So I think they're, they're kind of, they're price themselves out of it. So it's partly shifting into home ownership, partly it's segmentation of the market so that the other folks are looking to more affordable sections of the market. Overall, I did. I was showing you professionally managed overall rental household growth right now is running at about two hundred thousand a year, which is uh, better than better than shrinking. But um, it had been growing at four hundred thousand a year not too many years ago. In the twenty ten to twenty fifteen, it was a million a year. So mm -hmm. the overall shift in the age structure of the population and the the, the price levels are really uh, softening demand for those professionally managed apartments. And another question I have for you is, have any of these studies focused on the disparities due to race in this country or state? Being in the affordable housing industry, how does this information help us to address the lack of home ownership, affordability, and access to safe housing? Yeah, you know, I mean, in terms of, you know, understanding those racial gaps, I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, part of the, the, the let, let's just take, you know, African-American households as an example. So there's a historical legacy of discrimination in labor markets, education markets. So if you look at the income profile of households, African Americans make less. So there's there's a there's an issue there in terms of income qualification. There's issues in terms of historical legacies of discrimination and not my parents didn't own a house, and so like my ability to build wealth is less. So there's less wealth. So you can look at some of those gaps in terms of income and wealth, um, and it carries over to credit scores as well, which are impacted again by you know whether or not you have the income and the wealth and the like to to deal with crises when they arise, and that'll impact your credit score, and that exp explains some of it. But I think we also have to look beyond that to the supply of housing, where it's located, what's happening in neighborhoods in our cities, and so if you look at you know if I'm an African American household looking to buy a house in the community I've been, and that neighborhood is gentrifying, it's going to you know create a further affordability barrier for me to be able to buy in the community where I want to live. So I think we have to look at what kind of housing is available, where is it in communities that people want to live in, and certainly access to mortgage financing and having mortgage financing that's flexible around income and wealth and credit is going to be an important part of that. I personally think that we also need to have larger and more significant down payment programs because that lack of wealth is such an incredible barrier, and particularly for families that can't go to the bank of mom and dad to make it up. And sadly, you know, for people of color, that bank of mom and dad isn't there because of things that happen to that generation as well. Does that answer more, the question, Bob? I think so. One more question now, we'll save the last one for later. This is from Shamil Yersalami. What can be impacts of high, I guess more and more enough pricing for housing on state stability of markets? So pricing and stability of markets, that's from Shamil. Um, stability of the markets. And you, can you uh, what's in, the, in terms of the renters being able to stay in their housing kind of thing? Uh, it, the question didn't state that, but I'm assuming rentals and in maybe home ownership. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about those indicators of stability for renters. I mean, I think that the, the degree to which markets are becoming unaffordable is 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 being reflected in measures of instability in evictions and home homelessness, and I'll talk about that. Um, we're not yet on the homeowner side, haven't seen uh, any significant increase in foreclosures. I will say that I think the forbearance programs during the pandemic were highly effective, you know, being able to give people a pass on making payments, rolling those missed payments back into the end of the mortgage proved to be highly effective and hopefully lessons for the future. The fact that house prices had gone up so much meant that people had a lot of equity to be able to provide a cushion. And the fact that unemployment rates are as low as they are means that people haven't, you know, had the, they still have their job. So on the homeowner side, people who have bought houses, um, we haven't seen any instability and to any great degree yet. A lot of people are also sitting on 3% mortgages um, because they were able to take advantage of that. So, but more on the renter side, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Carry on. All right. All right. So let's talk about renter affordability. So this, uh, this chart is showing you two things, the bars are the number of renters who are either severely or moderately cost burdened. So cost burdens we measure as 
people paying more than 30% of their income for housing. The notion being, if you're spending at that level, you're not leaving enough left over for everything else. Moderate burdens are between 30 and 50% of your income. Severe burdens are where you're spending more than half your income on housing. That's the bars, the line showing you the share of households with those cost burdens. Um, this chart kind of buries in some sense uh, the magnitude of the, the, the deterioration of affordability between 2001 and 2011. If you look there, you'll see that in 20, 2001, we had 15 million renters who were cost burdened. By 2011, it was up to upwards of 21 million. So a gain of 6 million, almost a 33% gain in a decade. The share of renters went by from about 40% to 50%. That was a decade when rental affordability deteriorated at a really alarming to alarming degree. From 2011 to 2019, we were kind of in a stable market in that the number of renters who were cost burdened didn't change much. And because we had overall growth in renter households, the share fell from about 50% to 47%. So as we wrote our annual reports, we're always saying, well, things got a little better this year. Things got a little better this year. But the little better was relatively little relative to how much uh, more significant the increase had been before that. So we were really in a situation where things were better, but not a whole lot better. Now you look at 2019 to 2021, and things got a whole lot worse during the pandemic. Not surprisingly, when you see rents going up at 14%, 15%, Incomes aren't going up that fast. The result was a big increase in the share of renters who were cost burdened and the number. So in 2021, we had a record number of renters, just over 21 million cost burdened. The shares back up to 49%. Data for 2022, which is just coming out, will show that both those numbers are at record levels. So we, we've had a, if you look over the longer sweep of things, renter affordability got really bad in the first part of the decade kind of held its own at a bad level for much of the last decade, and now is starting to get a whole lot worse. So there's a lot of affordability woes in the rental market. But let's peel that back a little bit. This chart is now showing you those trends over those decadal interview interval, intervals by income tier. If you look at the bottom tier, you can see that the share hasn't changed that much over time, in part because so such a large share were cost burden to begin with. What has changed is the share who was severely burdened, which went up by about 10 percentage points over that period of time. So burdens overall didn't change, but severe burdens did. But those two middle income groups, you can see that even though there was you know, not a big increase in between 2011 and 2021 in the sh overall share cost burden, there were big jumps in these groups. In fact, even bigger group jumps when you consider go back to 2001. So what we've seen over the last two decades is this issue of rental affordability, which had always been very significant uh, among lowest income households, has increasingly come to be a problem of middle income households. Households are working full time at decent jobs. And if we look even further and then break this down into three parts of types of markets, low cost markets, middle cost markets, and high cost markets, those are the yellow bars here you'll see that those middle income households and those high cost markets are cost burdened at rates almost approaching that of the lowest income households. So what we've seen is that this issue of housing affordability, which in 2000 was almost exclusively poor, poorer households, is now a problem of a more higher income, moderate income households. And it's changed the conversation in high cost markets about housing from issues around assistance to issues around supply and zoning and regulatory barriers. Now, mind you, these are important conversations, but it also deflects a conversation from happening still about those at the poorest, the bottom income uh, section of the market, and what are we gonna do about them? So we've kind of, we've brought in the tent politically, made housing more of a political issue for a, a broader section of people, but it also has complicated the conversation because the solutions for folks in the middle is not the same as the solutions for people at the bottom. In terms of instability, um, one of the, the markers that's been tracked uh, pretty carefully through the pandemic was the rate of evictions by Eviction Lab out of Princeton. And they showed that, in fact, there was a dramatic decline in evictions um, as we had eviction moratoria across the country that were largely observed. And then as those were uh, removed, we still had um, significant amounts of emergency rental assistance that helped keep the uh, victor at bay and kept the rental market stable. But you can see now in 2023, finally, with the ex expiration of much of that pandemic aid, 
evictions are now uh, above where they were in uh, before the pandemic and starting to rise sharply. So I think this, this significant degree of renter cost burdens um, is going to be starting to be felt in an increase in evictions. The other issue is homelessness. So this chart is showing you the number of unsheltered homeless in blue and sheltered homeless in orange. What you can see is that going back over the last six years, the sheltered population hasn't changed much. So a lot of the top line numbers around homelessness suggest that the problem hasn't been getting much worse. But if you peel it back and you look at the unsheltered uh, homeless population, that's been growing much more sharply. And then if we look further and say, well, where is it happening? It's particular states. And I don't, for folks in this audience, it won't be surprising. Here we have, from left to right, we have states ranked by the, the, the volume of increase in unsheltered homelessness. Arizona is number one, where it more than doubled over that period of time. But two and three are Washington and Oregon, where we've seen the number of unsheltered homeless just over that six year period go up by more than 2,000 um, in those states. What's interesting is that those places get Arizona, Washington, Oregon, get a lot of attention, but Texas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Colorado, Ohio are also places where this is occurring. On the right-hand side, I had to put California on its own chart because the extent of homelessness and unsheltered homelessness in California is literally off the charts with 110,000 people living on the streets, a gain of some 30,000 over that six year period. Um, and it's obviously, for, you know, you all who live out there know that this is a serious issue for the folks experiencing homelessness and a serious political issues for the mayors trying to wrestle with what do we do about it. All right. Uh, so, Bob, that's the, the renter affordability stability. Are there any other questions? I can give a pause there before I hit the last section. Yes, this is a good question. Is there any consideration that millennial, millennial and Gen Z homebuyers are often burdened with student loan debt? which can amount to basically a second mortgage. Great question. And the income to home price ratio of 5.5 is doubly concerning. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, one other factor that's certainly been a, um, a tailwind over the last couple of years was the, uh, more, you know, the holding off on people having to make any student loan payments over that period of time. I mean, that is, student loan debt is substantial. And it had been hanging over millennials quite a bit. The last couple of years, they haven't had to make those payments. I think that is one reason why I said, gee, you know, it seems surprising how sharp those increases in home ownership rates have been. I don't know this, I haven't seen empirically this measure, but I wouldn't be surprised if the, the moratorium on student loan payments wasn't a contributing factor during that period of time. And as, as you all know, as of October 1st, what is that, Sunday, Monday, Sunday, um, those payments are due again. That's going to be a significant issue because um, you know, folks with student debt, many of them have very high levels of debt. Those monthly payments are significant. So um, I do think, I think the questioner is right. I think this is a significant issue for millennials. They've had a little bit of a holiday that's helped and that holiday is over. So I think we're going to have a bit of a hangover as it were come next week. Okay. I need more questions. All right, okay, Chris, go right ahead. All right. I have one more section. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, the need to invest in the aging housing stock that we have to address multiple challenges. You know, one observation we have in the state of the nation's housing is that we look at the median age of a housing unit in this country. As of 2021, the median age of a housing unit was 43. So it's fair to say that the housing stock is middle aged. And if you go back to 1990, the median age of a housing unit then was only 27. It was just, you know, post college years. So a 43-year-old housing stock presents a lot more challenges than a 27-year-old housing stock. And given other changes, both in terms of the environment and in terms of our demographics, there's other reasons why our housing stock is going to be need to be invested in going forward. Um, this chart on the left-hand side lists um, all of those issues. As I mentioned, it's an aging housing stock. That, that just relates to the fact we're going to need to have more maintenance and improvements. We have damage from future disasters, reducing household emissions, addressing an aging population, and reversing decades of disinvestment in underserved neighborhoods. All of those factors are contributing to uh, strong arguments for why we need to have stronger policies for investing in existing housing. You know, we focus a lot, I do, having this talk on new supply. 
Um, but we don't talk a lot about, well, what do we have to do with that? Most of the housing stock in this country is older and how do we maintain it? So a couple of charts here just to illuminate this need. The, on the right-hand side here, we're showing you a map of where there are 59 million homes that are threatened by climate-related disasters. And those include floods and fires and uh, windstorms and rain. Um, and those, it's, you, know, you can see, spread across the country. It's heavy along the, the, the West Coast and the Gulf Coast. It's also inland in the Midwest. Um, and that totals 59 million housing units. And so thinking about what do we need to do to make sure that these homes have the investments they need to become more resilient to these disasters, whether it's wind or flood or rain or fire. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here is just the need to uh, update the housing stock for an aging population. Uh, this is uh, the right-hand side showing you the number of households in older age groups between 2020 and 2040. And looking at the right-hand side there, the number of households over the age of 80 are going to double from 8 million to six, more than 16 million over the next 20 years. And people over the age of 80 have a number of challenges related to their housing. One is their mobility issues decline. And so making sure your house is safe for you to be able to get around it. Does it have first floor living? Does it have um, handles on the doors? Does it have extra wide doorways if you need to have a wheelchair in use? Um, does it have light switches and sinks and the like that are reachable from those wheelchairs? Not much of our housing is. Is that housing also located in proximity to either public transit or within short, dis short distance to things like grocery stores and doctors and churches? So much of our housing stock in our older households are living in low density dispersed housing. And as they get above 80 and can no longer drive, how are they gonna connect to those things? And lastly, as you have more need for the activities of daily living, or you might need support to stay in that house. And how do we get those, those services connected with people in their homes. So, um, I, you know, I don't have a slide on it, but I also think it's really important to think about neighborhood dynamics and the fact that many neighborhoods in this country have been subject to decades of disinvestment. They tend to be uh, predominantly uh, communities of color. Um, and there's a there's a, a spillover effect from the disinvestment of one property and its impact on another. And so thinking about a geographic concentration of investment to make sure that these, these communities have a healthy cycle of investment and reinvestment is really important. So Bob, I'll stop. Oh, let me just share my last slide is a, this a, a selfless promotion for the website. So this is where you'll find this report. Um, you'll also find interactive maps. I referenced the one about the distribution and the uh, cost of rental units over time. There's others. We have a bunch of Excel tables Slides from the report are there in PowerPoint format with the data, so you can actually see the data behind the charts. And as I said, a bunch of downloadable charts and graphics. This is our signature report. We also have a report on rental housing, on aging, and on improving the housing. All of them have similar resources. So I hope you will check out our website, sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't, we put out a couple blogs a week, papers, and, and uh, virtual events. So that's my, that's my commercial, but I'll, I'll stop sharing there. Well, I will tell you, for those of you who have not looked at their website, which I look at as my Bible for this industry, please subscribe to that newsletter. You will find great, timely information that will help you. I have a couple of questions on the docket, and then I have a bunch myself if you don't jump in. Uh, Les Polk is asking, have the studies included the use of existing structures and infrastructure to convert to rapid housing opportunities? Example of vacant commercial buildings, parking structures, and storage facilities. I want to add to that high-rise buildings that are going to be vacant because office has been changed? Um, it's a great question. You know, I we have not been involved in studies like that ourselves. I mean, you know, certainly during the pandemic, there was a real push to convert old hotels into rapid rehousing. So California had a, a big program to do that. A number of other places followed suit. Um, you know, that was a little bit of a window open during the pandemic when those hotels and motels were in limited demand. Um, there were some challenges in making that into year-round housing in terms of the size of the units, the availability of kitchens and the like. Um, in terms of other forms of housing, I haven't, you know, I haven't heard much about fact, you know, commercial space and other kinds of industrial space. Um, certainly, there's been a lot of talk about conversion of offices into housing. Um, you know, my understanding of that is that 
it can work, but there's kind of a, a, a band of circumstances that have to align. One is, you know, residential properties have a much lower per square foot value than commercial. So there has to have been enough falling in the value of that commercial property to bring it within range of saying it makes sense to be resi. Um, the second thing is that residential obviously has a very different layout. Um, you can't have a floor plate that has a lot of interior space convert easily to residential because you need to have access to light and air for, for most of the rooms in a residential setting. Second thing is that you then also have to bring in a whole lot more plumbing and ventilation. So you have to have, you know, in big commercial spaces, you'll have you know, bathrooms for the whole floor. You have to have bathrooms for every unit. You have to have kitchens for every unit. Um, so there's a pretty high cost of conversion. So again, back to the differential between commercial and residential, it's not just that that the value has to be close enough for residential makes sense. It's, it's the conversion cost of rental has to be accommodated as well. So I've seen analysis done and it's like they'll identify specific buildings where there is enough fall off in, in commercial demand or the building is old enough that it, it would need rehab. Um, so it's a small share of buildings. The other thing that comes into play is whether or not local zoning allows for it, whether or not you know, changes in property tax regimes can. So some cities, I know the city of Boston is saying, gee, you know, we want, we want to encourage this. And the market dynamic right now, given our rules, is, isn't encouraging it. So what do we need to do to incentivize it? So, um, But to the question about uh, rapid rehousing, only thing I've, I'm familiar with has to do more with hotels than with those. But I, but I may learn from you all that that's happening. And we've done a lot of that in this city and the communities in the Puget Sound area. A lot of hotels from Everett down to Tacoma have been transformed into rapid housing opportunities. Here's a question from Julie Cooper. We have seen corporate and other in investors buy up lots of existing housing stock and hold as rentals, effectively taking these opportunities out of the hands of first time buyers. Is it feasible for government agencies to buy and resale and or land bank for affordability and bring them to the market? Also, do government entities have inventories of housing that they own already condemned or tax foreclosed that are available? Um, say, say that last part again, Bob. Also, do government entities have inventories of housing that they own already condemned or tax foreclosures or otherwise? Right. Um you know, um, so the question of whether or not governments can get in the business of, of buying these properties, um, you know, I, um, there's no reason why they couldn't, right? So um, here's the way I think about it. So what in investors are seeing, and it, 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 it depends on the market conditions, right? But let, let's take a market. And I'm sure in like Seattle area and much of eastern Western Washington in particular, you know, hot markets, lots of demand. You've got older apartment buildings. You know, what we sometimes refer to as naturally occurring affordable units, where they're they're a bit older, they haven't been maintained. So as a result, they have you know class C buildings, lower rents. Investors are seeing these as an opportunity to take from C to B or maybe even you know, B plus uh, by doing a little bit of investment, a little upgrading, a little rebranding. And, and having that impact on, on value. Um, there would be, would be an opportunity for the public sector to come in to be able to preserve that as more naturally occurring affordable housing. The challenge becomes is that if the investor is valuing it at that potential B plus and the public sector is valuing it at its current C, the investor will still win out in a bidding war for that. Um, now the public sector has the advantage of potentially having lower cost capital and so that lower cost capital can become a means of uh, outbidding or winning that bid. It does require the public sector bidder to be pretty nimble in identifying opportunities, acting on them and the like. And it's been hard for the public sector to do that. I think the example of that would go back to NSP, the Neighborhood Stabilization Program post foreclosures. Now, the idea was is that, gee, you know, there's gonna be all these foreclosed properties, there'll be fire sale prices, we wanna stabilize neighborhoods, Let's get money into nonprofit public hands. And what happened before anybody knew it is a whole class of investors came out of nowhere and were super nimble and came in and acquired a lot of those properties while the public process was slow and cumbersome. So I do think it's something that I think the public sector should be attuned to and whether it's public and, and or in partnership with the nonprofit sector, because locking up that affordable housing is important. Um, 
there have been some, I know New York City had a program where it was going to provide some low cost financing to nonprofits to do that. I had a student who was doing an analysis, trying to be proactive and identifying those properties to be able to have a steering wheel for nonprofits. Um, it's worth doing. I think we haven't quite figured out how to make the process nimble enough to compete with that private capital. Um, in terms of whether there is an inventory of these things, um, you know, um, my, what that brings to mind for me is more cities like Cleveland, Baltimore, Detroit, where cities have an enormous quantity of tax foreclosed properties and the like that is a big inventory and that could be potentially you know used to to for for affordable housing. Um, in higher you know higher cost markets, they often cities often have more of an inventory of land than they realize. Uh, whether or not it's parking lots that are being underused or it's public agencies that are low density. You know, you've got a public library that's in an urban area that's one or two stories where it could be 10 stories. So a lot of in, in higher cost, you know, faster growth markets, I think there are cities who are doing a care, more careful inventory of their assets and looking for ways in which they can leverage those assets for, for ha housing. Um, and so it's less that they're they're vacant, but more that they're underused. And that, and of the city of Boston, where I live, has been doing that with um, libraries and firehouses too. So uh, there's an opportunity there. I encourage cities to to do that inventory. I'm glad you mentioned that, Chris. We are in the state of Washington. We, the commission runs a land banking program that's bought land all across the state for nonprofits to redevelop. What we've done a little of and not enough of because we don't have enough funding for it is to buy redevelopment opportunities especially in areas that are seeing gentrification where there's still an opportunity to come in and as you say, buy and build up and keep that community right. stabilized. That's been a big challenge. Another observation I have, I'm in an old neighborhood of mostly rural track land that's being redeveloped. And we have a large developer who's building a bunch of homes that are priced really high for our marketplace. Then we had a DR Horton come in and buy a 21 acre parcel of that big development. And they built 170 some homes and surprisingly, many of them are owned by investor groups and their renters. And my own unscientific study of walking through and talking to them, they're multi-generational families in large 3,000 plus square foot housing paying over $3,000 a month in rent. That was, to me, a shock because it's a pretty upscale community coming in around me. But to have that developer come in and buy a piece and then the ownership be mostly handled by investors was shocking. They should be first-time homeowners. They were priced pretty affordable that price up a hundred grand in less than a year from what they were selling well, for originally to what it went up to the end. Wow. Um, you know, there's kind of uh interest rates as high as they are, you know, there's been this like if you look at an index of saying what what's it cost to own this property versus rent this property, because interest rates have gone up faster than rents over the last year. And so that and it has created an opportunity um for investors with low cost of capital to be able to to come in and take advantage of that difference. Okay. I don't see any other, please put your questions in the Q&A. Another question I have for you, Chris, is uh, you mentioned slack in the housing and inventory. And I remember hearing you speak several years ago about middle income housing. What maybe should communities and government be doing to create more housing in that income affordability range? Yeah, you know, I, I think certainly with what what cities and states can do is um, is, is really lean on, on zoning and building codes to try to uh, make it possible to have you know soft density, you know, and so it you know I live in Cambridge and as I walk through these neighborhoods that are fairly low density. You'll in the middle of the block you'll come across you know there might be some single family houses, two family houses, and then there's like an eight unit apartment building that was put in in the 1970s. It's two stories. It extends back. You know, um, they're not necessarily great looking, but you could never build something like that today. So I think, you know, we have to, um, as a city and the state, think about how do we make better use of land through higher density, but it doesn't have to be super high density. I'll give an example. Um, in Massachusetts, the state passed a law just a couple of years ago that said, if you're a community served by the mass transit system, either directly or indirectly, there's 175 of them, that you need to have as of right in your community, at least 50 acres of land that's zoned for density of 15 units per acre. Now that's not super high density, that's a three-story building, or maybe it's some townhouses in a pretty tight cluster, um, but it's it's land, it's a zoning that doesn't exist in most of those towns now. 
And if you add up those 175 towns times 50 acres times 15 units per acre, let's say hundreds of thousands of units. And those units will be these missing middle units. They'll be these uh, lower density, but higher, low, higher density than single family housing. So just by doing that, the Commonwealth has put into place the ability to add an enormous amount of middle, middle, missing middle housing. So uh, it's just an example of the power of zoning, I think, to help uh, pave that path. And another question I have is from Julie Cooper again. Can an income tax incentive be created for sellers that sell affordability or are to a certain income level, especially if they are carrying the financing? Kind of a complicated question. Can an income yeah, tax incentive? Um, yeah, that's a really, um, it's an interesting idea. I know that I've seen that proposed. It certainly could be, right? I mean, think about um, if I, in the land conservation world, you know, if I go to donate uh, a piece of land to Trust for Public Land or the Nature Conservancy, then there's a big tax write-off for the fact that I'm changing the, the use of this property. And so that, you know, creates a big tax incentive for people to make those uh, those um, transactions. Sounds like I, what I'm taking from this is the same idea. So I'm, I'm going to sell a property. I'm going to, it's going to be kind of income restricted in some way. It lowers the value of the property. Why not give me a tax benefit for that? Um, Seems like a good idea to me, Julie, if you want to write it up, <laughs> if it hasn't been already. I have, I'm not sure, I haven't heard of a proposal like that, but it's an interesting one. Okay. I heard the question from Michael Soper. What can we learn from other housing programs in other countries? I'm thinking about social housing, which is on the ballot here, which has been approved actually here in Seattle. Oh. Um, you know, uh, I think that I, I would point to that kind of general category of uh, of housing. Social housing is one of those things where um, it, everybody will give you a different definition of it. And the definition I'll give give you of it is a couple elements. Key element is that it's permanently affordable, right? So you think about the low income housing tax credit, it's affordable for 30 years, you know, it depends upon the circumstances, right? But the idea is that ultimately it reverts back. We've got to have housing that never reverts back, and that's known from the beginning. Um, the second thing is that it has to serve a broader range of incomes. They can't be housing only for people at the bottom of the income distribution, but serve a broader range. Why is that important? It's important because we, we don't want to get away from having these bright lines that say, I'm at 49% of AMI, I get assisted. I'm at 51% of AMI, I got to move out. Um, we can't have those bright lines. The other thing is, as I showed you earlier, those cost burdens are moving up the income spectrum. And politically, there's a whole lot more to be gained from combining the demand and need for affordable housing across the income spectrum. And I think you create healthier, more vibrant communities by having that income mix. Um, what can we learn from other countries? I think there's models where you combine this kind of stewardship. It could be public or it could be nonprofit that are the stewards with some sort of community engagement. So the community has some say over it. You take some sort of cheap debt, public debt, um, and some li more limited operating subsidies, and you can create models of housing and build it up over time so it becomes a much larger bulwark against the market pressures. So, you know, in Vienna is probably the, you know, Austria, where you have social housing is a big part of the market, but in Switzerland, in the Netherlands, you know, these are places where people live in social housing and it just looks like an apartment building, right? And some people are living in there paying market rates. Some people are there at just slightly below market rates and some people are there at deeply discounted rates. Um, and they become more of the community. Switzerland has interesting models where they're cooperatives, where people can come together and create their own association, benefit from some public subsidies. Maybe there's land involved, maybe it's low cost public debt. And you're agreeing to keeping that, that, that building affordable in, per, in perpetuity, but it allows a lot, a thousand flowers to bloom. So I think these social housing models, there's not one model of them, but I think the ingredients are, think about you know public assets, land or low cost debt, think about long-term stewardship and think about a broad community that's sharing that stewardship. No one size fits all. No one size fits all, that's for sure. Well, Chris, you've done it again. We've had a very fast hour. I want to thank you for your time and your knowledge. And for those of you who had questions, I want to thank you for posing those questions. This has been a great ride with the Housing Washington 2023. Tomorrow will be our last presentation. It will be 
what the heck is going on in Washington with David Bradley of the National Community Action Foundation. Chris, do you have you met David? I have not, but I love that title. I got a, I got a, I got a new writer for my titles. Well, it's it's free, so come on in. What the heck is going on in Washington State? Yours truly will be narrating that one as well. I want to thank you again all for showing up. Remember, there is a survey that you should fill out. We please ask you to do that. And again, if you can give a little clap for our friend Chris and welcome you again, Chris. Thank you. Bob, thank you. You're a terrific moderator. It's great to be have, have this conversation with you. Great. Take care, all. Bye-bye.